Lord, we do come to you this morning so needy, and we pray that you would help us to learn from you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 here, which is a little review. He called unto him his 12 disciples. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, heal all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease. The names of the 12 apostles are these. The first Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew's brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded, commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return unto you. Return to you. Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or the city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now, so, so far in this section, we have seen how meticulous, and we just read this, it's really a very meticulous set of instructions here that the Lord is giving to his messengers as he sends them out. And this shows us how important his messengers were to him. And so really, when you look at this section here, what you can see is a sort of a holy, if you want to call it this, intensity. There was an intensity to, to, to what the Lord Jesus was uh, commanding them, instructing them, showing them what they had to do. There's a kind of a holy intensity. And you see this, it was, it was uh, the Lord was highly intense in prayer to get the mind of God to the Father, to get the partnership, to make sure he was right on with exactly which of these many disciples that he had that he was to choose to be apostles. That was an intensity in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, where it says, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night to pray in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his, his disciples, and uh, of them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. That was an intensity, this continuing all night in prayer. It's intense. Why? Because it was intensely important to get it right. It was intensely important of, you know, it was a, a sort of like, Father, I really need to know beyond any shadow of a doubt exactly which individual person you have chosen for me to have as apostles. Now, you know, when you think about that, don't you think it would have been a whole lot easier if the Lord could have just gotten a fax from heaven with the list of the ones, you know, all the apostles? But, and, and why did there have to be all this drama that, uh, uh, about who to choose as possible, apostles? Or why did it take all night in prayer to know who to choose for apostles? Why did, why did there, there have to be this kind of laboring, like giving birth in prayer that Paul talked about that he experienced like the pain of a delivery of a baby when he said in Galatians 4.19, Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Wouldn't it just been, wouldn't it just been a lot easier for Paul just to have given them, given these new believers a book that with something like Christ form in you 101 or something like that? Then Paul could have just uh, have gotten progress reports about how Christ was being formed in him and how they were doing in the faith. Why did it have to be all this trauma of this travail of Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, just thinking about that, childbirth, why couldn't children be just be delivered by the stork? <laughs> 
Why does all this, 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 this coming of the children have to involve all this pain and this trauma uh, and travailing in birth? There, there, so anyway, there's just a lot of intensity here with, 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 in the choice of which specific persons, which specific disciples are, are selected to be named apostles. Very painful childbirth type of uh, prayerful night when, uh, and that it resulted in the birth in verse 2 through 4, the names of the 12 apostles are these and so forth. It goes through, that's the birth. Now, second, so that was the first high intensity was the, was the, the actual choice. The second high intensity were, were the specific authorities that the Lord gave to his apostles in verse 1 when he called unto him his 12 apostles. He gave them power, which is really the word authority, against unclean spirits to cast them out, heal all manner of of, uh, sickness and all manner of disease. So there was an intensity here again in giving this specific authority. The Lord just didn't say in a nonchalant way, well, you just go out there and and you should have what you need uh, to, to, to get the work done. It was intense as he was giving you these specific tools in essence, he was saying to him, you know, you're going to run up against unclean spirits. And these unclean spirits are going to oppose you. And, they're gonna, and, and, and you're going to find that those un- specific unclean spirits have actually taken possession, possession of people. And, 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 and they control the people. Therefore, I'm going to give you specific authority against those unclean spirits. I'm going to give you specific authority to cast out those unclean spirits out of those people. And and there was this intensity when the Lord gave them uh, this authority over those unclean spirits. And there was an intensity, second, when he gave them a a, a specific authority. He said, here, here the Lord saw that his messenger apostles were going to encounter all kinds of sicknesses and a whole variety of diseases. And here again, the Lord did not say to his apostles, well, you're going to run into so many sicknesses, you're going to run into fever and bloody discharges and poisonings, et cetera, and, and, and you know, and oy vey, you know, you're going to run into all kinds of diseases, leprosy, cancer, blindness, you know. And just do the best he can to help these people out. No, there was an intensity to the Lord when he told them, I'm going to give you specific authority over all those various sicknesses and those different diseases that you're going to run up against. So again, the Lord is very intense in giving them specific authority over the unclean spirits, over the sicknesses, over the diseases. And then the Lord was, it was highly intense when he, he was telling the apostles, where you go to, in, in verses 5 and 6, he, he, Jesus sent forth and commanded them. This is not a suggestion. And this is not a recommendation. This is a command. Commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Sam- Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Lord was not indifferent as to where his apostles should go and where they should not go. And he did not, he, he did not say to his messenger apostles, well, you just go, you just go out there, you, be, you just go out there, be like a cloth in the wind, and just uh, cast yourself to the wind, and where the wind carries you, that's where you'll be. It's not what the Lord said to his messengers here. It was a very definite intensity when the Lord said to his, his, his messengers, he said, you see those roads? that go into the Gentile areas, don't go on those roads. You see all those roads that go right into all those Samaritan cities? Don't even think about walking down those roads. You have no business on either of those roads that lead to the Gentile areas or into the Samaritan cities. Stay off them. And that was a very intense direction for them to stay out of the Gentile areas and the Samaritan cities. And the Lord left no doubt where they were to go when he said in verse 6, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the Lord left no doubt as to how they were to view their, their fellow Jewish brethren, how they were to view 
Israel. They were to view them with the word lost. Not unsaved, but lost. Not mistaken, but lost. Not misguided, but lost. Not human and not perfect, but lost. So there was an intensity in the Lord's description of the Jewish people. They're lost. And there was an intensity when, in essence, he was saying to his messengers, I'm sending you to lost people. That's who you're to go to. And then fourth, there was an intensity in the Lord as he told them what they were to do. You are to preach. He says, preach. Don't just speak, preach. Don't just teach, preach. Don't just explain, preach. And then they were told to heal the sick. Don't just comfort the sick, heal them. They were told to cast out devils. Don't just rebuke the devils, cast them out. So there's an intensity in how the Lord told them exactly what they were to do. And then there was an intensity as he told them exactly what the message was that they were to preach. He said in verse 7, As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message was good news, that the kingdom of heaven has now come down to earth. Their message was also a warning because he said it was at hand. In other words, there was a limited time to respond to the good news of this invitation. It was the at hand uh, invitation. There was, and if there was a delay and there was a procl- uh, pro- pro- um, how do you say it? A pre- pre- procrastination. If there was a pre- procrastination, then the at hand could easily become the slipped out of hand. And so there was an intensity to what he would told them to preach. Then there was an intensity on how the Lord told them to prepare for the trip. You know, there was an intensity. as He told his messengers for how they were to make provision for their trip. Now, we've all prepared to go on a trip. And the last thing we want, any of us want to happen when we've gone on a trip is to be on the trip and to say, oh no, I forgot to take this something, you know. So what do we all do? We make a trip list. We make a trip list, you know, a do not forget to take on the trip type of list. And, and when we pack, we got our trip list, you know. And the Lord, the Lord took their do not forget to take on their list. He, and he said, now let me see that list that you've got there. And it was an intense time when he sat down with their do not forget to take on the trip list. And he says, okay, first item on the trip list, gold. Nope, eliminated from the list. No gold. And the second item on the trip list, silver. Ditto. To scratch the silver from your list. Third item on the list, brass. Nope, no brass. Fourth item on the list, Script or a bag, which was usually used for carrying uh, quantities of food. Nope, no bag. The fifth item on the list, two coats. Nope, just the coat you're wearing, just one coat. Sixth item on the list, shoes, in addition to their sandals that they were wearing. Nada on the shoes, no shoes. Seventh item on the list, an extra walking stick. In addition to one, nope, no extra walking stick. So that's kind of intense. It's a real intensity there as the Lord is scratching off items off of their trip list. And we can feel this intensity as those messenger apostles were feeling the pinch of no cash, no bag, no food, no extra coat, no shoes, no walking stick. I'm feeling a little vulnerable here. What if I run out? Run, run, what, what, if the, what if the what if happens to me on the trip? And the Lord was saying, don't worry about it. The Lord anticipated this anxiety that they were feeling when he said, in verse 10, he said, look, he says, uh, 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 just to meet your anxious feeling right now and your feeling of vulnerability, here's here's what you have instead. One statement, the workman is worthy of his meat. Now, what does that mean? The workman is worthy. Who is the workman? Well, they are. The apostles are the workmen. And, 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 And who's gonna provide the meat that's what I would be wondering about. I want to know where the meat is. I don't care about anything else. <laughs> Where's the beef, you know? They say, who's going to provide the meat for the apostles? Well, the one who sees that the apostle is worthy. Well, who would that be? 
Well, that would be the one who the apostle, the apostle workman is working for. That's the Lord. So the Lord is saying, look, if you're, you're, you're out there and you're doing a good job, he says, you know, the, God the Father, you know, we're, he's not going to disregard your work and say, well, you know, forget, forget about him. No, he's going to say you're going to get So what the Lord is saying with this intensity to the apostles is, look, you're working for God and God thinks that you're worthy in your, in your, if, uh, of meat in your work. So he's going to give you what you need so you don't have to, to put it on your trip list. He's got it on his trip list for you. Seventh, there was an intensity when the Lord told them that the first thing that they should do when they come into a new town, he said in, in verse 11, into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire in it who is worthy, who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. So the Greek word for worthy here means uh, suitable. Suitable, it's the word axio, suitable. It means like suitable to receive the, for example, suitable to receive the message, suitable to receive the gospel message. So he told them that as soon as you go into a city, start asking people uh, about who's in the city and who, and, and try to figure out who you think would welcome the gospel message that they had. Now, eighth, the, the eighth thing is there was an intensity in, 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 in that the Lord told his apostles what should they do when they come into a new house, when they come into this house of the one who they see as suitable for the gospel message in verses 12 to 13. Verses 12 to 13. When you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. And if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. So this is an intensity now that the Lord is telling his apostles to, to um, kind of respect the house. That, that, and and if, if you saw there, there's a hunger for the Bible. There's a hunger for God. There's a hunger for the gospel message. Then you stay there and you pray that there should come peace to that house. And then last... There's an intensity here to when the Lord is telling his apostles, his messengers, exactly what to do if a house chooses not to or no longer to receive them and hear their words. In verse 14, whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house, shake off the very dust of your feet. All very sp specific instructions here, all very intense, specific for he was specific as for who they were that were being called to go from being disciples to apostles. Very specific for the authority and the power that was given to them. Very specific about where they were not to go and where they were to go. Very specific on what they were to do when they and, 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 and very uh, 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 preach, very specific on what where they do when they come to a town, very specific on what they were not to bring on their trip, very specific on what to ask when they arrived in the town, specific on, on, on what to do as they're being received, and specific on what to do when they're being kicked out. Yeah? So there's a lot of intensity here with all these specifics for the apostles. Now, we, 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 as we saw here, the Lord is very specific and directing his messengers. And he, gives, and he gave them specific instructions, as we saw, about the provisioning. You know, no gold, silver, so very specific where not to go, and so forth and so on. Now, but with all those directions and all those specifics and all that intensity, what's interesting here is that is that we can see that the, that the apostles were free to choose certain things. And, uh, and, and it's in verse 11. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter. That means that the Lord did not give each of his apostles a specific itinerary. Let me see now. Peter, here's your itinerary. This is where you're going to go, Peter. James, here's your list. Who's the next one? Uh, 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 so forth. Uh, Andrew, here's your list. In other words, he gave the apostles the freedom to choose which cities they wanted to go in. You see that in verse 11, into whatsoever city or town you shall enter. You choose. It shows us that uh, the apostles were free to choose where they wanted to go. And if one apostle wanted to go to one city, fine. And if another wanted to go to another city, fine. 
And if two of them wanted to go to the same city, fine too. Those decisions were totally left up to each apostle. The Lord did not treat the apostles like puppets on a string, controlling their every move. He gave them certain specifics, and, he, and then he gave them the overall goal of their mission. And then, in essence, he said, there you go. You've got, you've got now where not to go, the Gentiles and Samaritans. You stay away from those peoples. You've got where to go, Israel. Israel is your go-to people. You've got, you, you've got the problem that you're there to solve. The Jewish people are lost sheep. You've got your mission, you, 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 which is to invite and warn, and you got what not to take, your gold, your silver, your brass and shoes, etc. Now you're free to craft out where you want to go. So the Lord gives us freedom to choose, just like the Lord gave the freedom to Adam to choose the names of the animals. It says in, in Genesis 2.19, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. It's kind of interesting to see the Lord say, well, let's just, I'm interested to see what's Adam going to choose. I'm not going to direct him. I'm not going to tell him, you know, but put words in his mouth. No, he's going to choose what to name the animals. It's going to be nice to see. I'm going to delight in seeing the what Adam chose to give the animals. Yo, look at that. He chose the word zebra and kangaroo and chinchilla and iguana and raccoon. <laughs> he chose all these names. And the Lord just was saying, now, now let's see what, what Adam's going to give to this one. Oh, that's an interesting name. And God never overrode Adam's decision, but he honored it. And he says, kangaroo it is. Yeah. And that's the Lord saying, let's see what James has chosen. Let's see which city James, what city James has chosen to go to. Okay, I'm not going to override James. That's a decision he made for that city. That's going to be what it's going to be for James. And it's the same way for us in life. God gives us certain instructions in life, and then he leaves certain choices up to us. Yeah, the, the, and, and anyway... And, uh, but whatever or city or town the apostles chose, the Lord told them what to do when they got there. They were to go around and they were to ask questions. Verse 11, whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and thereby till you go thence. So before launching into their ministry, they were to ask questions to find out about the people in the city or the town. They were to look for certain people, they were looking for a certain person. The person they were looking for was described as worthy. The, the Greek word behind the translation, I think I told you, the, the Greek word behind the word worthy is axios, which, which can mean suitable, suitable. They were to look for a person that was suitable. They had a message of rescue and salvation from sin. So rescue from hell, salvation from sin. They're, not everyone was suitable. Not everyone knew that they needed to be saved and rescued for, from sin. Thank you very much. But some did know themselves to be dirty, rotten sinners. And those are the ones that were suitable, worthy for the gospel. And this is what the, the apostles had seen the Lord do. They saw, the, they saw for themselves the Lord, the Lord target a corrupt, certain corrupt tax collector and come to his house, I'm talking about Matthew, who knew himself, he knew himself, Matthew knew himself to be a dirty, rotten sinner. So the gospel was suitable for Matthew. The Lord targeted a cheating Zacchaeus who was in a tree in, in Luke 19, Luke 19, behold, Luke 19, 2, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans. He was rich. He sought to see Jesus where he was, could not for the press, because he was a little stature. He ran before, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, and he was to pass that way. Jesus saw, came to the place. He looked up, saw him, and said, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. He made haste, came down, received him joyfully. When he saw it, they all murmured, saying, he was gone to be a guest with a man that's a sinner. 
Let me stop here. Why was he going to go be a guest of a man that was a sinner? Because the gospel was suitable for that man. Moving on. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have take, if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. Zacchaeus knew himself to be a, this dirty, rotten sinner. He lied in order to take more ra- taxes and he made himself rich. Zacchaeus was suitable. He was worthy for the gospel. The Lord targeted Zacchaeus as the person whose house he should go to. And, 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 uh, now, when the Lord told his disciples to, to, to go search in a city, inquire into who is worthy or suitable, he's directing them, do as I did. Search for a person who knew himself to be a dirty, rotten sinner in need of the gospel. They got salvation. And, 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 and you, so he told that the, the apostles that as long as the person they were staying with appreciated the gospel message, wanted to hear God's message of redemption, stay. He said, you're just to stay there. And verse 11, there abide till you go thence. When his, when his messenger was come to the house, they were to salute it. Uh, it doesn't mean this, but it means, the Greek word there means to wish it well, wish it well. And the specific well that they were to wish it on that house is in verse 13. If the house be worthy, suitable, let, it, let your peace come upon it. Let your shalom come on this house. In other words, they, they were to pray that their shalom would come to this house. Peace, it, or, the, or the lack of peace, no peace, is the plague of sin. It's the plague of sin. Isaiah 48, 21 to 22. Isaiah 48, 21, 22. And they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out. There is no peace, saith my God. Uh, no, there is no peace, saith the Lord unto the wicked. Now, when you read the first part of that, Isaiah 48, 21, you read the first part, Isaiah 48, 21, you really get a, a, a sense that, so what could be wrong? Everything is provided for. They're in the desert. God leads them. They didn't get thirsty. In order to make sure they didn't get thirsty, he even causes water to gush out of a rock. That sounds very nice. When Israel's in the desert, he provided everything to them. God gave them water for their thirst, even if it meant coming out of a rock. All they had to do was just go collect the water. They, they came out, that's all they had to do. God provided for them. For their hunger, God provided food for their hunger, even if it meant raining bread from the sky every morning. All they had to do, just go out, collect the food God provided for them, they were provided for. God provided for their feet to be protected, even by having their shoes miraculously not wear out for 40 years. All they had to do every morning was put their shoes on. Everything that Israel needed was physically, was provided, everything that Israel needed physically was provided for them in the desert. Outwardly, Israel was more provided for than if they were in Hawaii, in the desert there. Physically, Israel had no physical needs in the desert. And that's uh, that's the verse that that we're talking about there in in Isaiah, verse 28. That's what it's talking about. All their physical needs were met. But the next verse, verse 29, Isaiah, uh, uh, Isaiah 48, verse 21 shows everything was met for them. But the next verse, verse 22, Isaiah 48, 22, shows that there was something that was a great need for Israel in the desert. Again, Isaiah 48, 21. They thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He claved the rock also. The waters gushed out. There is no peace, saith the Lord unto the wicked. So in the desert, 
Israel in the desert had no physical needs. Outwardly, they had what they needed, but inwardly, they had a need that howled through their souls like the desert wind. And that need was peace. They had no peace. No peace. Lo shalom. And that's what the situation is today. Many people today, they have all of their physical needs met. Food and drink, you, you walk into an Albertson store, you're almost overwhelmed by how much food and drink there is there. Clothing, closets full. Housing, more than adequate. Weather, San Diego. All the physical needs are perfectly met. But there's one howling need among people. Peace. No peace. No inner peace. Peace, that means that people today suffer from restlessness. A restlessness that drives them into a compulsive work. A, a, a drive to make more and more and more money. How much money is enough? It's not enough. A restlessness that drives them into a destruction of Relationships, the destruction of their marriages, restlessness of, that results in insomnia, restlessness that results in, with a, an anxiety and a, just an under, uh, a, a feeling of, of, uh, of fear, restlessness that drives into alcohol and drugs and pornography, a restlessness that comes from no peace, as God said in Isaiah 57, 20, Isaiah 57, 20. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. Outwardly, all is provided for inside raging sea. And the reason for this condition of no inner peace is because, Romans 8, 7, Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's an enemy of God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 5.10, Romans 5.10. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Sin makes a person to be the enemy of God and results in no peace. Sin sets up a warfare with God and results in no peace. The person outside the Lord Jesus Christ, he may be thinking, I don't, I'm not, what am I, an enemy of God? I'm not an enemy of God. I don't think about an enemy of God. I don't even think about God. What's the enemy, you know? But when he really thinks about the law of God, the, 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 the Ten Commandments, if even, in, in the Bible, he's afraid. And when he really thinks about death and just the possibility of having to face judgment after, after death, he's alarmed. And when he really thinks about hell, it's terrifying. And all of those thoughts are disturbing, and they trouble. So he tries not to think about them, but, but really, it, he's robbed of peace. There's no peace. So this was the gospel, good news, the message of the apostles. The gospel, good news, is really summed up in one word, the gospel good news is summed up in one word, and it's the word ready, ready. It's the word ready, just that one word. The good news that the gospel, that the apostles brought to, 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 and, and, to them and, to, and that you and I bring is the word ready. God is ready to be reconciled with dirty, rotten sinners and bring in peace. The good news that the apostles brought and you and I bring in is God is ready to pardon the sin of man, and bring him peace. The gospel good news is that God is ready to make peace with man. The, the, the gospel is that, is, that, is, that, is that all of the obstacles that stand in the way of man being united to God, like obstacles of the love of sin and, and the obstacle of rebellion against God, and the obstacle of a guilty conscience, God is ready to take them away. So that's the good news. It's good news. The good news is all about the word ready. God is ready to become friends with man. So this is the God's salvation plan. God's, God's plan is that he is ready 
to do all this, and it all centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. If a man accepts God's plan through the Lord Jesus Christ, then Isaiah 48.8, then Isaiah 48.8, oh, that they had hearkened to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Isaiah 66, 12, Isaiah 66, 12. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will, expen- I will extend peace to her like a river. So God's promise was and is that if a person embraces the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior, that peace would just flow like a river and there would be a joyful singing as it says in Isaiah 55, 12, Isaiah 55, 12. You shall go out with joy, be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. There is a singing because the agitation of of no peace is now turned to a calm. There's a singing because the fears that were once there, they're dead. They died. There's a singing because all that terror is now... It turned to a to a comfort and a rest. Singing, because the message in, in verse 7, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, meant, meant that really means the words of the, of the song. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away. My night was turned to day. Heaven came down. Glory filled my soul. What a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. When I was wandering in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. All this was what the apostles were bringing to the houses when it said in verse 13, let your peace come upon it. That's a real peace. That's an inner peace. Now the peace that they were bringing had a source. The peace had a source. It says in verse 13, your peace. He says to the then, let your peace. It's your peace. It was the peace of the apostles. It belonged to the apostles. It was a peace the apostles had. When they lost, the lost saw the peace in the apostles. They knew that I need that peace. I need your peace. And so the lost knew that they had to have the peace that the apostles had. And it was that inner peace the apostles had as source. That the, the, the reason that the apostles had that peace is because they got it from someone else. They got it from the Lord in John 14, 27. John 14, 27, when the Lord said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the peace that the apostles had was a real peace. It was an inner peace. The peace those apostles had did not really originate in the apostles, though they had it, but their peace originated in the Lord Jesus Christ, which he then called my peace. He says, my peace. And they received it from the Lord. He's talking about freely you have received, freely give in this passage. Well, this is their peace that they freely, because in John 14, 27, peace, my peace, I give unto you. It was a peace that took away all the trouble in their heart. And as he said, let not your heart be troubled. My peace give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So, that's a peace with God. That's the Romans 5.1, peace with God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so long as the person they were staying with, the host, the apostle, so long as that person was hungry for the Lord Jesus Christ, wanted the gospel message, they were to stay in the house, stay in the house. But as soon as the host was no longer interested in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his offer of peace with God, it was time to, verse 13, If it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. Tragically, there are some people today that just get tired of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. Some people just grow 
cold in their interest to the Lord Jesus Christ, like the Laodiceans did. In Revelation 3.14, Revelation 3.14, Unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That meant that once they were hot for the Lord Jesus Christ, now they just got tired of him. They just become... It's not that they became critical of him. It's not that they became antagonistic to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just the heat of the interest in the Lord Jesus Christ has cooled off. And now they're just in a state of lukewarm. And the Lord Jesus Christ said that he hates that state of indifference. So much he was going to vomit them out of their mouths. He, and he, it actually says, I really actually wish that instead of that, you were cold and antagonistic toward me rather than being indifferent and lukewarm. And their view of the Lord Jesus Christ, the things of God, was just, oh, same old, same old, I already know that, nothing really interesting anymore. And some people just have become today lukewarm towards the Lord Jesus because the fervent interest, it's gone, it's gone, gone, gone. And for others, if it's not that, then they became distracted away from the Lord Jesus Christ. They could be distracted away from the Lord Jesus Christ, just from the pressures of life, just from the, oh, I got it, all that I got to do. You know, in Mark 4.19, the, Mark 4, 19, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. They distracted away from the Lord Jesus Christ but the, by the I got to get this done list. They're distracted away from the Lord Jesus Christ by, I got to make money. They're distracted away from the Lord Jesus Christ by any, some other passion in life. And sometimes that distraction away from the Lord Jesus Christ can be distracted by religious works. Religious works. That's what happened to the Ephesians. The Ephesians in a Revelation 2 2, Revelation 2 2. Where, God, where he said, I know thy works. He's talking about their religious works. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake has labored and not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. It was their religious works that distracted the Ephesians away from the Lord Jesus Christ. But no matter what the distraction is, whether it's the pressures of life or money or some passion or religious works, the end result is the same there, which is no interest, no more interest, just not interested in the Lord Jesus Christ anymore. But the interest has been choked, has been choked off. And whereas in the past there was a strong interest in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the flame's gone out, and all there is is just ashes of, of where the flame was. And the apostles, have, and so the, the apostles are being told, if you see this happen in the house you're staying in, that's the time to let your peace return to you. Say, fine, you're not interested in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, then go back to your turmoil, inner turmoil. Verse 13, if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. As in, if they be not, no longer suitable for the gospel anymore, peace of God is withdrawn. Now, then he goes on and he further says uh, in verse 14, Whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of the city, shake off the dust of your feet. The, in other words, this is talking about a decided rejection, a decided refusal to hear. I don't want to hear it anymore. That, And the Lord views the, the re, the, this rejection as uh, of the, the message and of the gospels. He views it as a rejection of himself and a rejection of his word. So he says, in that case, shake off the dust of your feet. Now, shaking the dust off the feet is quite a vivid expression. It's, a expression, it's an expression of the, their rejection of the gospel. It's an expression of the uh, apostles choosing to separate themselves from them. It's, a, it's an expression of also 
the apostles rejecting, rejecting this, uh, this, this disinterest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, it's an expression of a, uh, of a threatening judgment that they're facing for, for, for turning away from the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's also an expression for the apostles of the end of their responsibility to bring the, re- the gospel to that person. They are no longer going to be held accountable. No blood on their hands as they, as they have done their job. As they've done their job. And this we, 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 we see in Acts 13. Acts 13, where this actually happened. In Acts 13, 44, Acts 13, 44, the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. And then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we return to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their cities. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. Disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, then he finishes in verse 15 by saying, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now why is that? What is the difference between Sodom and Gomorrah in, 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 and, and the city that the apostle was in and, and preaching the gospel? Well, the difference was all one word, and it's the word opportunity. Opportunity. Sodom and Gomorrah did not have the opportunity to hear the gospel, and, and they did not have the responsibility to respond to the gospel. But the city that the apostles were in had the opportunity to hear the gospel, and they had the responsibility to respond to the gospel. So this shows that judgment is, the severity of judgment is based on the the, the extent of the opportunity that was rejected, or or the greatness of the opportunity that was rejected. Great opportunity rejected, great judgment. Shows how serious it is. Serious this is when the gospel is presented to a person and he rejects the gospel. It's strange. It's strange that the better the gospel is presented and understood, the better the opportunity there is for that person to come and be saved from their sins. The better is the opportunity for that person to to rise to the heights of heaven if he accepts. And the worse, the judgment for him to be cast in the depths of hell if he rejects that great chance that was presented in the gospel. So these are the instructions that the Lord gave to his disciples, his apostles, as he prepared them to go out and be be not just learners, but now messengers of his, of his, uh, his gospel good news to the world, and, and may, may, God, may God help us to, to take to heart what he said for, as our own instructions as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our Lord Jesus, and what a great preparer he was and is, and Lord, we pray that, that we would, Lord, take to heart all that he said this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.